It's our great pleasure this evening to bring you UCLA historian, Professor Robin D.G. Kelly. Our speaker will take questions after his talk if you would make your way to one of the two microphones in the aisles. Uh, afterwards in the lobby there will be a reception, though you may have drunk it all I think so I hear already, so I hope we get refills out there. Uh, Professor Kelly will also sign copies uh, of his books, so do please stay with us uh, for that. Tomorrow morning, as it says in your program at 10 o'clock in the Hall Center, Robin Kelly will lead a conversation about the vital issues he'll be raising this evening, a session moderated by Clarence Lang, Professor of African and African American Studies. These morning events are very interactive and very enjoyable. There's really great questions get uh, asked, so I do encourage you to attend. To introduce Robin Kelly this evening, I've asked Randall Jelks, Professor of American Studies and African and African American Studies. Randall was the Langston Hughes Visiting Professor at KU in 2008 on leave from Calvin College. This subsequently led to his appointment at KU. He's a graduate of the University of Michigan, BA, McCormick Theological Seminary, MA, and Michigan State University, a 1999 PhD in comparative black history. He's also an ordained Presbyterian clergy. His teaching interests include American identities, and religion in the African diaspora. He's held a Fulbright Chair in American Studies at Masaryk University in the Czech Republic, from which he centers too many envy-creating messages about his European travels. He's also taught at the University of Ghana. His research interests are in American religion, the civil rights movement, and religions in the African diaspora. He's the author of two award-winning books, African Americans in the Furniture City, The Struggle for Civil Rights in Grand Rapids, University of Illinois Press, 2006, and Benjamin Elijah Mays, Schoolmaster of the Movement, UNC Press, 2012. He's also co-editor of the journal American Studies. He is very well versed to introduce tonight's speaker. So please welcome my good colleague, Professor Randall Jelks. Good evening. So I have this pleasure to introduce Robin Kelly. So I want to say this about Robin D.G. Kelly. Robin D.G. Kelly is cool. It is not because he holds the Gary B. Nash Professor of American History at UCLA. There are numerous scholars who hold endowed chairs at, that are uncool. And he, he isn't cool because he is a prolific prize-winning author of such titles as Thelonious Monk, The Life and Times of American Jazz Original, Africa Speaks, America Answers, Modern Jazz and Revolutionary Times, Hammer in a Hole, Alabama Communists During the Great Depression, Race Rebels, Culture Politics in the Black Working Class, Your Mama's Dysfunctional, Fighting the Culture Wars in Amer Urban America, and Freedom's Dreams, The Black Radical Imagination, as well as numerous collaboratively written and edited volumes. Nor is he cool because he's writing a biography of of the journalist, social critic, adventurer, and activist Grace Hassel, for which he received a Guggenheim Fellowship, though that does have a tinge of coolness to it. And he ain't cool, though it is impressive that he's published essays in The Nation, Monthly Review, Mondovis, The Voice, Literary Supplement, New York Times, Art and Leisure, New York Times Magazine, Color Lines, Counterpunch, African Studies Review, Black Music Research Journal, Kalalu, Black Renaissance, Renaissance Noir, Social Text, Metropolitan, American Vision, Boston Review, American Historical Review, General of American History, and New Labor Forum and Souls, to name a few. What makes 
Kelly Cool or Dope, friends, colleagues, and students, is not his personal effect, though that is always cool too. What makes Robin D.G. Kelly cool is the way he sees and studies the world of work and play, labor and artistic creativity, resistance and struggle, theorizing and improvisizing to create a better world. Yes, I said it, and particularly I say it for students, I said it, what makes Robin Kelly cool is the way he studies. He brings to his writings and teaching an expansive imagination, a sense of himself as he journeys and struggles to be a Democrat, little d, a world citizen, an African American, a person from America's working classes, in tandem with his justice activisms. So if we were to define cool, Kelly exudes self-control or mastery, or as we say on the block, he be killing it. He's boss. He's fashionably ready to go. What makes him cool is his restless curiosity and brave articulations of democratic freedoms deriving from his careful reading of the histories of black freedom struggles. So without further ado, friends, colleagues, students, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Robin D.G. Kelly. Okay, now that was the coolest introduction, you have to admit. Uh, no one's ever introduced me like that, and that's very, very cool. So, um, so Randall, Professor Jelks has a standing invitation to my funeral. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. Um, okay, so uh, there's so much I want to cover. I know we're running behind time, so I'm going to, I had a long, long list of thank yous, but I'm just going to make some general thank yous. Just thank you to the Hall Center uh, for inviting me. Um, it, this is a very uh, distinguished center. This is a in some ways, one of the nation's centers of humanities study and also the American Studies uh, Department here is just outstanding. I have so many friends and, and colleagues. I can't name them all, but you know that I love you and, you're, and it's just great to be here. Um, I also want to dedicate my talk tonight to uh, two organizations. One is Rock Talk Invisible Hawk uh, for all the work that you've been doing on this campus. Um, and I really say, I mean, really dedicate my, my words. And then also, I want to dedicate my lecture tonight to the Kansas Coalition for Gun-Free Campuses, you know. Because although I will be talking about guns tonight, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily my favorite thing on campus, you know, and I'm, I'm fortunate. I and mean, hopefully that will change. We'll see what happens. OK, so let's see, I got my, um, oh, it's, here's my thing in my pocket. I'm going to show you this picture. So this picture was taken by uh, one of uh, your colleagues here, one of your professors, uh, uh, Elizabeth Ash, Ash Betsy Ash. Uh, she's in England right now, and she couldn't be here. And she took this picture in Brixton um, just a couple of days ago. And it's interesting because I chose to use this photograph uh, in lieu of the iconic image of Mike Brown laying in the streets dead for four and a half hours, um, which is a disturbing uh, picture. It's one that requires trigger warnings. But I like this picture because in some ways this memorial erected 4,371 miles away uh, speaks to the meaning of Brown's death. And you know, like the song, dedicated to the other martyred Brown, who I'm going to talk about, John Brown, uh, this speaks to the idea that his truth goes marching on, that um, as a, a martyr, he represents more than just a dead body, but a possible transformation. Okay, so in any case, we've all seen that picture of Mike Brown's bull, bullet-riddled, lifeless body laying in the streets uh, from noon on August 9th, after he was gunned down by uh, Darren Wilson, um, and it took to 4.30 before the coroner moved his body to the morgue in Berkeley, Missouri. And 
as you know from the story, that Mike Brown lay there in broad daylight, 12 to 4.30. This was clearly an act of collective punishment, a lynching, as it were. The public display of the tortured corpse was intended to terrorize the entire community, to punish everyone into submission, to remind others of their fate if they step out of line. Now, the state has long treated black life as disposable. We see it in our expanding prison population, um, in the shockingly high rate of black casualties uh, caused by police, uh, private security guards, vigilantes. Um, and it's not simply a matter that black lives don't matter. It's not that, you know, in some respects, uh, black people are threats, enemy combatants in a kind of, in a war, which largely explains why police employ lethal force often as a first resort. And I can give you the long list of names. I don't need to do that because that's pretty much common knowledge now. Mike Brown and his friend Dorian Johnson were stopped for walking in the middle of the street, a violation commonly overlooked or in rare instances minimally fined. This is Broken Windows Policing 101. Um, Darren Wilson regarded Brown's uh, non-compliance as a challenge to his authority, which of course escalated into a verbal and physical confrontation between the armed officer and the unarmed teenager. Mike Brown was a casualty of a very long war. In fact, in my uh, 54 years on this planet, I've never known a time where there wasn't a war like this. I've never known peace. I started school when urban um, ghettos were across the country were under military occupation. I remember that. Um, I came of age when uh, Eleanor Bumpers and Michael Stewart and Eula Love were the war's iconic victims. These were the names uh, that were spoken from many lips uh, to be followed by people like Amadou Diallo and Oscar Grant, Patrick Dorisman, Malice Green, Taisha Miller, and Sean Bell. Okay. Um, and I'm not only speaking of the dead, but the harassed and the beaten, the humiliated, the stopped and frisked. Our parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents experienced no tolerance policing long before that term was in vogue. Uh, my late uh, father-in-law, in fact, lost his hearing in one ear after a cop in Bessemer, Alabama, took a nightstick to his head for being insufficiently deferential. African-Americans were commonly arrested for not yielding the sidewalk to white people, for joblessness, vagrancy laws, uh, using profanity in public, uh, spitting, loitering, violating segregation ordinances, reckless eyeballing, which I do all the time, by the way, um, and other absurdities intended to turn human beings into the caricatures white people had come to know through coon shows, uh, soap boxes, darky films, and mass advertising. The law never protected black women from sexual violence and treated all sexual encounters between white men and black women as not only consensual, but initiated by the woman. In other words, all black women were criminalized as presumptive sex workers and vigilantly policed while remaining vulnerable to the sexual predations of those wearing the badge. Uh, we can trace the, the all too common brutalization and criminalization of black women's bodies to slavery. So routine violence, flogging, torture, slaps, punches, assaults with household and agricultural tools, and of course rape, was uh, the most common cause of flight by enslaved women. And as the late historian Stephanie Camp revealed in her work, enslaved women experienced more violence, or, or experienced violence more frequently than men, this is some this is unknown information, in their secondary work for the big house, in their perceived vulnerability as women, in their position as sexual uh, uh, property and as sexual objects, of, uh, as objects of sexual jealousy. Um, let's see. Okay. So black women, especially poor women, continued to be monitored, harassed, subject to reproductive control on the pretext that they possess illicit or diseased bodies. The, their presumptive criminality means that they can be killed or disappeared with no corresponding investigation or concern. And I'm not talking about the past. I'm talking about pretty much right now. It's worth remembering that a string of unsolved murders of black women in Boston uh, led to the formation of the Combahee River Collective, whose 
statement we're always teaching and reading. Um, and Boston was no exception. Since the 1970s, incidents of femicide have engulfed black communities in Detroit, Charlotte, Peoria, Chicago, and Los Angeles. And in nearly every case, the police acted with indifference. Uh, many of the victims were labeled sex workers or described as homeless, thus rendered doubly invisible and doubly disposable. And I'm not talking about police violence against women. I'm talking about everyday uh, domestic violence, uh, many of the perpetrators being uh, black men themselves. So what, but the, the point is that the state doesn't always attend to those needs to, the, to their disappearance. Uh, Mike Brown and many others were killed in the name of law and order, but in truth, they were the latest victims in the greatest crime wave in global history. The war that birthed the modern world, that invented the Negro, that invented the Oriental, that invented the Indian, the savage, as a means of inventing European man, was built on the theft of human beings, on the theft of land and water, indiscriminate murder, violation of customary rights, enclosure of the commons, destruction of the planet, and just outright lawlessness justified by rationality or what Weber uh, might call instrumental rationality. And yet, those young people who spent months on the streets of Ferguson demanding justice from Mike Brown, uh, knowing that Mike Brown's body and soul belong to them, represent a dialectic. That is, the war to colonize, dispossess, enslave, and subjugate is also a war to decolonize, repossess, emancipate and democratize. A struggle on the part of racialized and colonized people to end racial capitalism's brutal war, to bring peace and, new, and a new democratic uh, just order to the world. So what I want to do tonight with the minutes I have left is to perform something of a, a deep historical autopsy on Mike Brown's body to reveal both the history of the racial regimes that allowed an armed agent of the settler state to take his life for refusing to comply with the order to walk on the sidewalk. The anatomy of modern state violence is rooted in colonialism, in slavery, uh, in racial capitalism, in patriarchy, and their attendant ideologies, notably liberalism. And in fact, I want to echo Sylvia Winter, Lisa Lowe, Uday Mehta, and many others and suggests that foundational to classical liberalism, and certainly basic to neoliberalism, are two things. One, a definition of liberty that places property before human freedom and human needs. And two, an exclusionary definition of the human that permits various forms of unfree labor, dispossession, and subordination based on race and gender. Overturning these two components and really trying to restore uh, the commons to the commonwealth has been at the heart of this kind of radical abolitionism that I'm referring to. But a genealogy of the modern racial state that took Mike Brown's life requires a similar genealogy of resistance. These were bodies with minds, right? Which is why I tend not to say black and brown bodies that much. I try to say black and brown people because sometimes we forget that bodies are actually people and people are animated here. Um, fundamentally opposed to the colonial project, resisting extraction, dispossession, demanding self-possession, the restoration of territory, the restoration of the commons, the right to livelihood, the right to live. They were both the necessary cogs in the colonial machine and the obstacles to its functioning. So by reconstructing part of this history, I hope to reveal alternative possibilities for creating democracy rooted in freedom, justice, and decolonization for all people, for all people. So let me begin sort of in the middle of my story. Um, Dred Scott's name was dropped often during the Ferguson protests, and mostly quoting Chief Justice Roger Taney's infamous line that black people had uh, quote, no rights which the white man was bound to respect. But in focusing on that soundbite, we ended up missing one of the main consequences of Dred Scott. And that is, it, and here we are in Kansas talking about this, it, it rendered the Missouri Compromise unconstitutional and opened the door to make slavery legal everywhere in the United States. That was the possible ramifications. And what made the majority opinion 
uh, Judge Taney's opinion, such bad jurisprudence wasn't the declaration that black people were not citizens. They, they weren't treated like citizens, except for in certain states. But rather, their decision to rule on the Missouri Compromise after declaring that black people did not have the right to sue in courts. Now, if you don't have to be in law school to know that you can't like, basically say people don't have a right to sue in courts and then continue to, to, to rule on the case. The case should have been dismissed at this point. But Tawney and the majority ruled anyway because their real agenda was to overturn the prohibitions on slavery. They ruled that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional because one, Congress never had the power to govern territories and therefore had no power to prohibit slavery. And two, and this is very, very important because this is the foundation of liberalism, slaves are private property. And to deny slave owners um, their private property with, without due process is a violation of the Fifth Amendment. Now enter my favorite Kansan of all time, John Brown. He wasn't born here, but he stayed here for a significant period of time and, and made a difference. Um, in any case, it was the Supreme Court ruling on Dred Scott that convinced John Brown to strike the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry. And by the way, for the students who don't know this history, run to the library tonight tonight and read everything you can about Dred Scott and John Brown and the 1850s and the eve of the Civil War, because this is your history, right? His original plan was to launch guerrilla raids on plantations in Virginia. Now, why? Why did he change his mind? Why did he go from guerrilla raids to, on plantations in Virginia to Harper's Ferry, which is the federal arsenal, which seems like suicidal? Well, because the Dred Scott decision proved to Brown and to many black abolitionists, that while slaveholders were morally accountable for holding human beings in bondage, it was the federal government that sanctioned and sustained the institution of slavery. Slavery was then a national crime, and the federal government was slavery's prime source of authority and protection. In 1858, in preparation for the raid on Harper's Ferry, Brown spent several weeks uh, hanging out at Frederick Douglass's house, where he drafted what he called a Declaration of Liberty by the representatives of the slave population of the United States of America, and in what he called a provisional constitution and ordinance for the people of the United States. Now, this new constitution was not only the antithesis of Justice Taney's opinion on Dred Scott, but it recognized enslavement itself, right, as none other than a most barbarous, unprovoked, and unjustifiable war of one portion of its citizens upon another portion. War. Now, we can debate all day about the raid's accomplishments, uh, but what Brown did, in effect, was to force anti-slavery sympathizers to come off the fence because as, he was, as far as he was concerned, there was no moderation or compromise on the question of slavery. He presented a model not of the ally, but of the comrade. For Brown, it was never black humanity that was in question. It was white humanity that was in question. Silence and inaction in the face of human bondage meant complicity. And complicity was dehumanizing because slavery was barbarism, right? So if you're complicit, you're no better than the barbarian. To become human required risking life and limb to end slavery. That was the bottom requirement to become human under, in the slave regime. For whites willing to follow Brown, freedom was an unearned privilege in a land of slavery. The act of insurrection was a symbolic repudiation of that privilege. Now, there are other lessons as well. I'm also invoking Brown here to remind us of, one, federal complicity in upholding police terror, Two, that, the Missouri, that Missouri, like Kansas, had been ground zero in an armed struggle against slavery, and to make an even more controversial claim that John Brown was absolutely right to characterize slavery as a perpetual war. His followers did not start the Civil War, but they entered into an ongoing war on the side of the enslaved. In other words, um, and this may be somewhat controversial to Civil War historians, but what we call the Civil War was really one theater of an Atlantic war to subjugate, dispossess, and enslave indigenous peoples in Africa and the Americas originating in the 16th century, and to create a landless proletariat within Europe through enclosure and colonization. 
as with the, the Irish, for example. So war begins, I'm arguing, war begins at the point of settlement with the shipment of kidnapped Africans across the Atlantic, the enslavement of indigenous people, with uh, rape and pillage and forced removals, not to mention religious conversion and compulsory assimilation. Imperial expansion, slavery, settler colonialism, acts of war are acts of war. So slave revolts, for example, or indigenous resistance are acts of self-defense. Okay? Historians have long suggested that the first shipment of enslaved people were something like indentured servant, servants, right? And you could read this. Um, and then there's a, there's a whole litany of, of laws that are passed in the 17th century that cemented racial slavery in their role as chattel. That is laws against miscegenation, for example, laws uh, allowing for the killing of enslaved Africans without any punishment for the, if the, if the murderer is a master, for example, without penalty. Um, and then there is the fact that the export of some 12 to 15 million people could not take place without complicity on the part of some Africans, right? But none of this contradicts the fact that Africans were forcefully uh, kidnapped. They were, in fact, prisoners of war. All were prisoners of war, okay, like enslaved Indians. The procurement of slaves cannot be called a trade. Like, this is not a trade, okay? There was no ready slave market, like, already set, prepared to sell to Europeans. That was a product of a relationship. Human beings with no intention of becoming slaves were enslaved through warfare, banditry, sometimes debt, and kidnapping. Slavery was imprisonment, not servitude. And for this reason, some scholars don't even use the word slave trade. They use the, the term mafa, right, which is Swahili for the great disaster or unforeseen catastrophe. So, um, like, this is, not, this is not trade, right? This is not what we can call a trade. This is kidnapping. This is war. Right. There. Um, the idea that 1492 marked the beginnings of a perpetual war on the planet is hardly novel. Um, traces of the idea that modernity itself is a state of war, or formed in a state of war, can be found, you know, you can read it in Hobbes, you can read it to a certain extent in Marx, in Nietzsche, uh, and certainly in Fanon, in Emmanuel Levinas, and others who understood war as endemic to the colonial order, but not um, a natural state of, of human nature. Um, U.S. historians invest so much time parsing out the positions of the so-called founding fathers vis-a-vis -vis the legal and juridical apparatus presumably constructed for the protections of liberties that we end up missing the fact that the U.S. state retained many of the same functions as a colonial state. So dispossession should be seen as a kind of tri-continental process, initially and ultimately a global one. And, and I want you to follow me here because I'm going to talk about some things that may not seem like they, they go together. But we have to consider, for example, enclosure in Europe, in the Americas, as well as captivity, expropriation, and transfer by enslavement in Africa, in the Americas, as part and parcel of the same process. Enclosure is yet another example of violence, masking as law, order, and security. Backed by the rule of law, the state employs violence to discipline, to reclassify, criminalize, and destroy sovereignty and create disorder. So keep in mind that enclosure, you know, by enclosure we mean um, in, in the English countryside, for example, building fences and walls around areas that were once held in common or available through the commons, um, and, and basically expropriating people from their land. That's what we talk about by enclosure. But keep in mind that enclosure is part of this process of war, war on the commons, which ultimately turns part of the expropriated into a proletariat. That includes an industrial proletariat, a maritime proletariat, a landless rural labor force, prostitutes and beggars, a portion into settlers, you know, and a portion are sent um, to the workhouse, right? A portion are merely casualties whose flesh mingles with the earth and whose bodies, sometimes hanging from a tree or broken on the wheel, serve to terrorize those who resist the new discipline. Oops. What the colonial order did not want, and what scholars like David Rodiger, who's here, and Peter Lombard remind us, was that the victims of this tricontinental dispossession 
Um, they didn't want them to find each other, to find each other in common. They didn't want them to find each other, they didn't want the landless whites, for example, to become a new made Indians. They didn't want the landless whites and the Indians to join the Africans in the practice of marinage. They did not want what Peter Leinbaugh calls commoning. And by commoning, we're talking about alternative ways of living outside of the, 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 the sort of colonial joint stock company's um, ownership of the land, um, living in the swamps, in the hills, away from capitalist relations of productions and class rule. Because in some ways, these were challenges to the status quo and perhaps the earliest manifestations of abolition democracy. Now, as, as, as everyone knows in this room, yesterday was Tom Jefferson's birthday, right? As Jefferson's birthday was yesterday. And I know, I know you celebrate it. Um, in my circles, Jefferson's birthday is an occasion to speak about Jefferson's contradictions as an Enlightenment thinker who opposed slavery uh, in principle, but held humans in bondage, including his own children, right? But I actually think that the contradiction that, that Jefferson wrestled with, and I want to be fair, that he actually wrestled with it, he didn't avoid it, uh, wasn't simply a product of his own unique position as master at Monticello, but rooted in the very Enlightenment liberalism that shaped both the Declaration of Independence, which he mostly drafted, and the more cautious, compromising language of the Constitution. That is to say, the question of whether the enslaved were property or persons held in service. This problem, whether they're property or persons held in service, profoundly shaped the drafting of the Constitution and led to nearly a century of hand-wringing among liberals about like, how to legally abolish slavery in the United States. Like, how can we legally do this? You know, and, and this is the story. Now, the truth of the matter is that African people, enslaved African people, were very clear. They were neither property nor persons held in service. There were none of those things. And here, we got Prince Hall's words. But Prince Hall, you know, an enslaved person in Massachusetts, uh, submits his petition in 1777 that stated that they were human beings, quote, unjustly dragged by the cruel hand of power and victims of a crime stolen in violation of the laws of nature and of nation and in defiance of all the tender feelings of humanity, brought hither to be sold like beasts of burden and like them condemned to slavery for life. This is the work of, of philosophical interrogation that challenges both of these claims about what is a slave, right? This is a very important work that should be, I mean, that petition alone should stand right next to John Locke's um, uh, two treatises on, on, of government, if I could teach John Locke something. Um, in the US, without enclosure, there would be no slavery, nor Jefferson's dream of a white republic, of small landed producers, nor trails of tears, nor reservations, nor convict labor camps. Just consider the fact that all formal wars in North America, from Bacon's Rebellion, the American Revolution, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, up through the Civil War, were fundamentally over territory. And not just any territory about expanding slavery, and legitimizing and consolidating settler sovereignty over both land and people. The one exception, of, of course, was the Civil War. In the case of the Civil War, the outcome was different. Um, this was the war that destroyed formal chattel slavery, and it delivered the 13th Amendment. Right? Uh, besides a half a million so-called contraband uh, fleeing union lines, 186,000 men don union uniforms and fought their former masters on the battlefield. Those who survived returned to their communities as liberators, as a new generation of leaders, and they returned armed. And for a while, they stayed armed, forming black militias to defend their communities um, and the fledging democracy that they attempted to build. Even before the 14th Amendment, um, black troops as assumed that they had actually earned their citizenship on the battlefield. They said, we solved Dred Scott, we proved it, right? They protested abusive treatment at the hands of federal um, officials and former Confederates alike. And they pressed for entrance into the American civil and political society based on their loyalty to the nation. And yet, as W.B. Du Bois argued eight decades ago, 
and David Rodiger demonstrates in his latest brilliant book, Season Freedom, um, formerly enslaved people turned a war to preserve the Union into a war to end slavery and turned that into a revolution, reshaping politics and social relations in the economy. Abolition unleashed the possibility of a genuine democracy in the United States, a genuine democracy in the United States that could have really shaped democracy all over the Western world. Okay, so let's talk about this genuine democracy. The free people's democratic vision radically differed from their former masters and northern capitalists. Some of these ideas they inscribed in the state constitutions they drafted during radical reconstruction. Um, for them, they expected the state to provide economic support to those in need, uh, to protect its citizens from violence and exploitation, um, to provide free universal public education, housing, public services for all people, not just for black people, but for all people, to work actively to defend um, equality, to achieve equality, uh, to abolish imprisonment for debt, to abolish public whipping, to provide uh, funds for roads and railroad construction and other improvements, and to take land from the criminals, that is, the former rebels, the former masters, uh, who waged this war in the first place and redistributed it to free people as reparations for unpaid wages. That was their vision of democracy, their vision of, of a new state. And in fact, I would submit that it's in Reconstruction, in that failed or destroyed vision of democracy, that lay the origins of social democracy, not just in the progressive era of the early 20th century. In any case, but what Du Bois called the abolition democracy was born amid a continuation of perpetual war. There was no peacetime. In fact, if we think about the periodization of the war, the war doesn't end in 1865, right? It continues. Political assassinations of black leaders were commonplace, not just in the South, but in the North as well. Uh, white democratic political violence was organized, but so was the response to it. Black militias, and Union League stayed armed. They brought their guns to the polls. Uh, they kept vigil outside of uh, homes and churches and other institutions. They returned fire with fire. And indeed, uh, more common than the classic lynching scenario in the era of Reconstruction were shootouts between African Americans and former Confederates. Now, we'll never establish an accurate body count, uh, but when black Congressman Robert Smalls of South Carolina left office in 1887, he had estimated that something like 53,000 black people had been murdered since emancipation. 53,000, most, mostly in the South. Um, political assassinations, beatings, the torching of homes and churches and schools, this was just a fraction of the kind of political violence that pervaded the South in this period of Reconstruction. Sexual violence, rape, and other forms of gendered violence also constituted a terrain of political struggle. This is political violence. Evidence of rape is staggering. Um, the two key stories here are, one, how uh, the state utterly failed or refused to protect black women from sexual assault. In fact, you could say even further, protect women across the board from sexual assault. It's, com it's complicated. We could talk about that in terms of the class dimensions. Um, also, the other story is how black women, through their own courageous testimony of sexual violence committed by white men before the Freedmen's Bureau, um, you know, claim, they were able to claim citizenship by demanding protection from violence and affirming their right to control and possess their own bodies. So by arguing you know, relentlessly that state protection from sexual violence was a right of citizenship, which is still not the case today, um, they literally expanded the scope of social democracy to make the prohibition of sexual violence a public matter and not a private one. Now, Reconstruction didn't just fail. It was defeated violently. Um, the defeat and the implications it has for the future of a racialized, uh, of racialized state violence offers an occasion for us to think about the nature of the state um, during this period of democratic possibility. First of all, African Americans saw the state as an instrument through which to transform society through land redistribution, 
extending the franchise, education, progressive taxation, and meeting out justice. And as I suggested before, it's about protecting citizens. Um, and they understood that they had to create ways of self-defense to do that. But we also have to remember that the state in the South had virtually collapsed. And union military power and institutions like the Freedmen's Bureau assumed elements of govern governance in its absence. What followed was a reconstruction of the original settler state form, not a remaking of the state. And this is important since reconstruction proceeded uh, on the assumption that the state was primary, if not sole arbiter and protector of black rights. Of course, it looked this way because the military arm of the federal government entered the South by force, destroyed the state form in the region, leaving open the possibility of a new state and radically remade with the task of enfranchisement, land reform, and punishing traitors, ensuring freedom and protection from violence, issuing marriage licenses, et cetera. Um, and it was an amazing moment when local forms of governance were really rebuilt and, and in some respects run by former slaves. Uh, but secondly, what actually emerged in the South was a form of dual power. And I know this is on people's minds right now, so let me say something about that. By dual power, we're talking about a situation in which Confederates, former Confederates, represented an organized force whose coercive power in some regions virtually matched, if not exceeded, local state power. Uh, the federal government in the form of coercion was often what tipped the scales, right, in, in, in favor of the, the, what's considered the legit, legitimate state. The question we may want to wrestle with is whether the vulnerability of social democracy in the South rested with the weakness of the state or whether the state was simply not the best vehicle for making the revolutionary changes desired by free people and their allies. So from this vantage point, the problem of transforming the South, of sort of really instantiating that democracy, the problem of revolution, revolutionary transformation, violence, land redistribution, workers' control, all that begins to resemble places like Russia during the, the Bolshevik Revolution, or Mexico during its revolution, or Spain during the Spanish Civil War, when workers and peasants were reorganizing their workplace, dividing up big landed estates, forming their own militias and people's armies, and doing this without the state or in spite of the state. And this is the other side of dual power. That is, black people created institutions with, out, with Republican allies um, and took actions that were independent of, if not antagonistic to, even the Republican ruled state. But in many cases, they were ultimately sanctioned or rendered illegal or premature. Um, African Americans abided by these decisions, committed as they were to law and order, and believing ultimately that the state was the only avenue to make change. The withdrawal and inactivity of federal troops is cer certainly important, but we've got to remember that it was a demobilization of black soldiers and militias that turned the tide. Political power ensured that white terrorists would not be prosecuted, and the, the Supreme Court made sure of that. Um, this is perhaps the most important point. What fell under the rubric of extralegal violence was actually sanctioned by the state. African Americans understood this, and this is why it was amazing when you look at like, what offices a lot of black people ran for, they ran for offices that had to do with the justice system. They, they ran for you know, um, sheriff and for coroner um, uh, and for all these things that have to do with justice system. They wanted law and order. Uh, they wanted a court system that would prosecute while protecting fundamental rights of habeas corpus. Um, in any case, terrorist organizations like the Klan wage war, uh, and by extension, they, they wage war on abolition democracy. Um, violence only increased in the South, not just behind masks, but open insurrection. And still, the last sigh of democratic struggles took place in the South in the 1880s and 90s. And this is part of the story that I just want to just focus on for a second because we think of Reconstruction ending in 1877. And I would actually say that it really ends about 1898. And let me explain why. In the 1880s and 90s, you have all these like, amazing biracial coalitions, uh, the Greenback Labor Party, the Readjusters, Knights of Labor. Um, and they're fighting 
biracial coalitions fighting to defend black voting rights in the 1880s to raise wages and improve working conditions, and in some cases committed to a revolution to overthrow corporate power and create modern social democracy. But it took force, an outright war, and appeals to white racial loyalty like these, right, um, to defeat the progressive coalitions, which explains why formal disfranchisement doesn't begin until like 1890. Um, the defeat culminated in a coup d'etat uh, in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898. And if you don't know the story of Wilmington, you should look it up. I can't tell you the whole story, but basically in 1892, Republicans and populists defeated Democrats in North Carolina's election, winning the majority of the state house and senate seats electing dozens of African Americans to local offices. Then, six years later, 1898, the Democrats are swept back into power uh, with the help of white populists who switched allegiances. The exception was the majority black city of Wilmington, North Carolina. And so what happened there was, you know, whites, many of them came from outside the city, took up guns, overthrew the elected government killing scores of black people and some loyal white Republicans. Now, there was a real coup d'etat. Two years later, the state formally disenfranchised black voters through poll taxes and literacy requirements. And all of this coincides with the war on the Western Front, the final pacification of the Plains Indians, um, the final battle at Wounded Knee in 1890, uh, the, the, um, and then tragically, you know, these Indian wars involved some black soldiers who participated as well and then would go on to fight on behalf of the U.S. empire in Cuba, the Philippines, and Mexico. So in the end, war destroyed slavery, but war also killed abolition democracy. It smashed the last vestiges of Indian sovereignty and transformed the appearance of the colonial state into what we know today as a modern racial security state, opening the path for overseas and extended um, American empire. Now, the last part I want to talk about is make a, a leap, I'm going to jump now um, over a lot of history to talk about the Second Reconstruction to the present, to say something about the defeat of the last abolitionist movement, crushed again on the shoals of race and property, and crushed by both modern liberals and neoliberals. So we have to go back to, eight, uh, to 1963, 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, to the March in Washington. Now, at the core, the march in Washington was about economic justice. We sometimes forget that. Um, the brainchild behind the march in Washington in 1963, we know about King's famous I Have a Dream speech, but the brainchild uh, behind it had its roots in socialist and labor movements. Uh, people like Bayard Rustin and veteran black labor leader A. Philip Randolph. Um, in his rarely cited speech, uh, at, at the March of Washington, he says, you know, we have no future in a society in which six million black and white people are unemployed and millions more live in poverty. Nor is the goal of our civil rights revolution merely the passage of civil rights legislation. Yes, we all want, you know, we want all public accommodations open to all citizens, but those accommodations will mean little to those who cannot afford to use them. Yes, we want a Fair Employment Practice Act, but what good will it do if profit-geared automation destroys the jobs of millions of workers, black and white? Okay, so you have economic justice as one theme. The second theme was violence. The, I mean, think about what's happening in 1963. You have the, the violence in Birmingham in the spring of 63. Um, you have the murders of Herbert Lee, the murders of Medgar Evers in Mississippi, the attacks on voter registration um, uh, campaigns. Um, and it's noteworthy that August 28th, 1963, wasn't picked by accident. It was picked for a reason, because that was the eighth anniversary of the murder of Emmett Till. And this is Emmett Till's mother. I refuse to show the picture of his body. Um, the, so that's what they were thinking about. So violence, racial violence, state violence, vigilante violence, and economic justice were the twin themes of the March on Washington. So what happened? What happened to this vision of economic justice and ending state vigilante violence? Several things. First, a lot of the big groups behind the march, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Congress on Racial Equality, NAACP, Urban League, they threw their energies behind passing a watered-down civil rights bill, 
supporting the Voting Rights Bill, and most importantly, influencing the Democratic Party. Second, the labor movement itself betrayed the coalition's racial justice agenda. Rank and file white members of the unions are worried that the elimination of racial barriers to equal wages, access to skilled jobs, and unfettered access to housing would threaten their privileged status. Third, Randolph and other male leaders deliberately excluded black women's organizations from playing any significant role in the movement. And this weakened the coalition, in part because a lot of the leading activists, people like Pauli Murray and Anna Hedgeman and Dorothy Robinson and Gloria Richardson and Dorothy Height, they were already committed to linking labor and economic justice to questions of racial and gender equity, as well as dealing with state violence. But despite that, it doesn't mean that the radical agenda that, that, that really sort of formed the March on Washington was lost. It, it wasn't lost. In the decade following the march, uh, many black organizations like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, and the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party not only um, embraced um, uh, 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 a, a program of economic justice, but went even further, calling for the redistribution of wealth, uh, reparations, workers' power, collective bargaining, and an end to U.S. military interventions abroad. In 1968, as you can see, the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party adopted one of its most uh, radical planks in the country, guaranteed annual income, extended daycare for poor and working mothers, comprehensive medical care for all, right, based on a single-payer model, increased federal provisions for food stamps, high, free higher education, an end to the draft, uh, full military withdrawal from Vietnam, renewed diplomatic ties with Cuba and China, and an arms embargo on South Africa and Israel. Um, now, no presidential candidate has this, as far as I know, um, not, not even Bernie Sanders, you know, uh, but, you know, but he's getting there. Um, economic justice, self-defense, and protection from state and vigilante violence, including sexual violence, were the key issues taken up by groups as diverse as the National Welfare Rights Organization, the Poor People's Campaign, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers, the Black Workers' Congress, the Young Lords, the Black Panthers, the Combahee River Collective, and the National Abortion Rights Action League. These were the principal organizations of that era. And whatever their flaws and contradictions, they each embodied and built on aspects of this radical democratic vision, whose roots, I argue, go back to Reconstruction. Meanwhile, as struggles against racial capitalism and war and patriarchy were ramping up, um, a global economic slump in the 70s opened the door for the expansion of neoliberal policies being implemented in the global south. In the US, the economic crisis produced unemployment, trade deficits, a deepened third world debt, it fueled capital flight, and on and on and on. Workers responded with a wave of strikes, uh, further justifying the attack on labor by neoliberal uh, 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 intellectuals and corporate figures. It also justified claims that capital needs to go elsewhere where there are no unions and less regulation. The economic crisis also opened the door for privatizing public assets, for the devolution of the welfare state, for prison expansion, for remaking tax codes to benefit the rich, not just among Republicans, but Democrats too. And we could talk about that in Q&A. But basically, the, the policies that are dogging us right now did not begin in 2008. Uh, you could begin to see them in the late 60s, early 70s. And in fact, it's the triumph of racial liberalism, it could be said, that helped usher in the rise of mass incarceration and the deepening criminalization of urban space in the post-World War II period. Um, I had something to say about this, but I'm going to skip over that. Um, but I would suggest that you know, if you get a chance to read Naomi Murakawa and Elizabeth Hinton's new book, they lay out exactly how liberals backed expanding criminal justice system to protect Americans from mob violence, to quell urban rebellions, but ultimately led, contributed to mass incarceration. Now, this, all this that I just laid out, is the context in which late 20th century colorblind discourse begins to take root preparing the way for what we know as to broken windows theory. Um, now, first elaborated in 1982 essay uh, by George Kelling and James Q. Wilson, broken windows 
place the blame for urban decay on the social values and behaviors of the poor, primarily black people. Um, and as the argument goes, uh, criminals flourish in deteriorating disorderly neighborhoods, and disrespect for one's community leads to disrespect for authority, and if you have disrespect for authority, you disrespect the law, and it becomes this vicious cycle. As long as so-called ghetto residents lack concern for the condition of their neighborhoods, crime would run rampant. Small infractions would become the gateways to violent crime. Right, that's the whole idea of broken windows. In other words, by ignoring the structural factors that suppressed home values, that perpetuated health and environmental catastrophes, that divested neighborhoods of essential jobs and services and government pro programs, as well as legal protections, broken windows essentially um, uh, blames culture and immorality for crime and in turn poverty, okay? So we get to permanent war. The last part I wanna address, and that is the protests in the wake of Michael Brown's murder displaced um, Israel's war on Gaza in the 24-hour news cycle. It wasn't Brown's death that was newsworthy, but it was the riots that followed, so-called riots, riots in quotes. It wasn't the mere existence of protesters that made Ferguson an international story. It was the fact that the people who took to the streets faced down police in riot gear, rubber bullets, armored personnel carriers, semi-automatic weapons, in a dehumanizing policy designed to contain and silence. To the world at large, Ferguson looked like a war zone because the police looked like the military. For black residents of Ferguson and St. Louis proper and for ghetto communities across the country, it was already a war zone. Suddenly, critics and pundits who had little to say about the killing of black and brown people by the police were indignant um, about the hardware, about the AR-15s, the armored personnel carriers, the helmets and the flak jackets. Mike Brown's hometown, in his hometown, this takes the form of routine stops, um, fines for noise ordinance violations like playing loud music, uh, fair hopping on St. Louis's light rail system, uncut grass or uncut property, trespassing, wearing saggy pants, uh, expired driver's license or registration, disturbing the peace, or as we know, walking in the middle of the street. Unpaid fines or tickets often result in jail time, and that's what we talk about, the, the modern debtor's prison. Um, the Ferguson story kind of exposed what is now a national, what has been for a while a national problem. And that is, you know, you get these tickets and you have to pay an inordinate amount, of, uh, inordinate amount uh, to a bail bondsman to get out of prison, or jail rather. Um, you might lose your car or property, or you might even lose your child to so social services. The point here is not to punish um, black communities, but to mark them, to create a record of criminal behavior, to transform them from citizens to thugs. If you have a, a, a community in which there are 1.5 warrants out for every single black person in that neighborhood, they all become thugs. As soon as protesters gathered on Florissant Avenue in Ferguson, uh, Missouri, to demand answers, all these bloggers, police officers, even mainstream media were quick to label Michael Brown a thug. When the Ferguson Police Department decided to release footage of Brown wrestling a store clerk over a pack of cigarellos, it only confirmed his criminality. So criminalization means to be subjected to regulation, containment, surveillance, and punishment, but also then to be deemed unworthy of that protection, of protection, period. Those targeted by the state are not rights-bearing individuals to be protected, but criminals poised to violate the law and thus require vigilant watch, not unlike prisoners. So it's like an open-air prison. So in place of habeas corpus, terms like thug, hoodlum, are used to differentiate the criminal element from the good Negroes, thus closing off the possibility of empathy with those who may have broken the law. Uh, so decriminalizing blackness, in other words, occurs not in the court of law, but in the court of public opinion. It requires proving that one is not a thug, i.e. by portraying Mike Brown or the Mike Browns of the world and Trayvon Martins of the world as the undeserving dead, by rendering them good kids, college-bound, college um, honor students, uh, they're sweet, 
you know, good kids, as if somehow their character is the only evidence they have of their innocence. So they're, they're guilty unless they can prove otherwise with their character. Thug works to both criminalize and dehumanize the dispossessed while masking the violent operations of the state and capital. And by violent operations, we're talking about criminal neglect of, by landlords and city officials, rampant fraud from mortgage brokers and loan companies to insurance firms and bail bondsmen, uh, unwarranted price hikes for commodities, rent and services, and the daily violation of human rights. In short, this is the actual source of thuggery, these kinds of policies. And yet, talk of black and black homicides, sagging pants and teen pregnancies almost always dislodges the focus uh, on state violence. This classic bait and switch move forecloses a deeper interrogation of how neoliberal policies are a form of state violence. And by that, we're talking about the erosion of the public safety net, you know, under Clinton and before and after. The, the, the privatization of necessary services such as health and transportation and water. Pay attention to Flint and Detroit and Highland Park and places like that. That is to say, policies rendered logical under a racist security regime that produce scarcity, environmental and health hazards, poverty, and alternative economies rooted in violence and subjugation. So the prime target of neoliberal violence has been our kids, our children. Remember, Khalif Browder, Mike Brown, Tamir Rice, Ayanna Stanley Jones, among others, were children when the bullet or prison took their lives. We see the consequences of neoliberalism in the laws that make it easier to prosecute juveniles as adults. In the deluge of zero tolerance policies that mandate uncontrolled, or unconditional, I should say, expulsion of students for possession of weapons, all weapons, um, drugs and other violations on or around school grounds. And we see it in the startling rise of suspensions and expulsions. Problems that were once handled by teachers, principals, and parents are now remanded to juvenile or criminal courts or the police. Um, crisis, moral panics, neoliberal policies, racism fuel an expansive system of human management based on incarceration, surveillance, containment, pacification, lethal occupation, and always gross misrepresentation. The toxic mix of privatization, free market ideology, and a punitive state come together in our schools. And those who survive the school to, of discipline and punish and the high stakes testing are faced with increasingly narrow opportunities for higher learning and social advancement. And Mike Brown is a perfect example. Uh, he was, after all, college bound. This is repeated, this is like a mantra. He was college bound. Evidence that his death was unwarranted and he was a victim of misrecognition. He's not that nigga that should die. You know, I hate to use that term, but he's not the one. Somehow he was different. But what did College Brown mean for Brown? What did College Brown mean for Mike Brown? He graduated from a high school in one of the poorest, racially segregated districts in the state that had ranked last in overall academic performance and had just lost his accreditation. He planned to attend Batarock College a chain of for-profit trade schools that has come under investigation for charging exorbitant tuitions, saddling students with debt, and failing to deliver the promised skills that could ensure secure employment. The proliferation of for-profit colleges and the dismantling and shrinking of public community colleges is a consequence of the neoliberal state's expansion. What appears as a free market solution, right, to replace a bloated state is actually a partnership. That is, the federal government underwrites these privatized, virtually unregulated institutions. In 2010, 88% of Vatterot's total revenue were derived from the federal government. That is, 86.9% um, from title, uh, 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 title IV federal financial aid um, and the rest from the Department of Defense. Okay, I'm sorry, 86.9%. Um, the Department of Defense has its tuition assistance program for post 9-11 GI uh, uh, funds. In other words, Vatterot targets veterans, redirects their meager benefits into the coffers, into its own coffers, and promotes US militarism in the process. Yet, veterans are not the main target. Vatterot recruiters are instructed 
to go after kids like Mike Brown, black and brown, poor and vulnerable. And according to internal documents, recruiters are told that likely enrollees are convicted felons, people in drug rehab programs, and I quote, welfare mom with kids and pregnant ladies, people whose, quote, decision to start, stay in school, or quit school is based more on emotion than logic. Pain is the greater motivator in the short run. That's from their document. So Brown's life was cut short, but he lived, had he lived, he would be faced with the prospect of a slow death, of bearing enormous debt without the prospect of a genuine livelihood while still having to navigate a world of constant surveillance and harassment. So pain is the greater motivator in the short run is the perfect mantra for neoliberal logic. That is to say pain and profit. Pain, or bearing witness to pain, is also a motivator in the short run to end the thuggery of the state. For every person we bury, there are 10 more driven to act against state violence, criminalization, and immiseration. All right. We see them in Ferguson and St. Louis, Missouri, in organizations like Hands Up United and Lost Voices, an organization for black struggle and Don't Shoot Coalition and millennial activists. Uh, we see them erupt Phoenix-like in Florida with the Dream Defenders in Chicago with We Charge Genocide and Black Youth Project 100 in Los Angeles with the Community Rights Campaign all over the country behind the banner Black Lives Matter. They are on the front lines resisting their own criminalization, fighting to demilitarize schools and streets, taking on the state directly. So pain may be the motivator in the short run, but love is their long-term motivation. They're not only trying to stop state thuggery, but they're creating a new community dedicated to a post-racist, post-sexist, post-homophobic, uh, post-transphobic, post-colonial world. In other words, what they're trying to do is what we call abolition, right? The abolition whose roots go back to the end of slavery. Mike Brown was a casualty of war. He died at the hands of an employee of the state whose salary and uniform and vehicles and bullets Mike Brown's family helped to pay for. This was no mistake, no act of misrecognition, no violation of police policy or code. This was just another day in the modern world, collateral damage in a perpetual war whose cloner roots are still alive today. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Um, I wonder what you saw in the, so if you think about like someone like Descartes at the very, Descartes at the end of uh, the discourse on method talking about how uh, given science's ability to allow man total subjugation over nature, black people becoming nature, um, anyone that's not uh, a Frenchman becoming nature, um, the total subjugation of nature by Descartes seems to me like a stance towards certainty that wasn't there maybe 30 years before when Shakespeare has King Lear on stage. Mm -hmm. So what do you see in the 17th century that 500 years ago, what do you see as sort of an instigation point or several causes that would have instigated that initial move towards defining who or what is human and what is not. Right. Okay, so you want me to present a discourse on the 17th century? No. No, I'm, I'm just saying. <laughs> that is a, it's an excellent question, and I think there's several ways to look at this. Um, first of all, I don't think the question of what is, where did you go? Oh, there you go. Uh, the question of what is, um, human was ever settled. Uh, and I think that part of the, particularly the 18th century, but not just the 18th century alignment, you go back to, to Locke, you know, which is 17th century, um, where uh, th there is a, a question of the, the invention 
the invention at that point, in other words, since humanity is not settled, the invention of what is considered uh, rational man, right? Um, that's not necessarily tied to, uh, it's, it's not unlinked from, but it's not necessarily dependent on a, uh, a focus on God. It doesn't mean it's a rejection, because you know, Christianity continues to exist. So I think, so that, is, I don't think it's accidental that the same uh, sources of economic um, development that allow for certain forms of urbanization, of finance, of um, the transfer of wealth, even intra-European, um, that all these things are pro providing the possibility of greater leisure and space to be able to think through these questions. Um, and it's not just that, but that's coincided, that is tied to the capacity to develop forms of both finance and production that are connected to the rising global economy. So global economy is not necessarily like, you know, um, not always about going all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. Sometimes it's about um, uh, Genoese capital investing in sugar plantations in the Mediterranean which is based on the exploitation of unfree labor. So unfree labor continues to actually expand. And keep in mind that 17th century, I think this is right, but something like, you know, the British historians could correct me, but a significant amount of the British population, like maybe one out of 10 and one out of 11, were considered unfree labor. And that's within Britain. We're not talking about you know, African labor. Or, we're talking about unfree labor, forms of slavery that continue to persist, even as the, the roots of the Enlightenment are emerging. Um, unfree labor is more of not the exception. You know? um, and because it's not the exception, my, my suggestion is that um, the, the very presence of unfree labor everywhere in the West and, it's, and being the foundation of the expansion of the West into the so-called New World uh, made the question of freedom more immediate. Um, and certainly for Shakespeare, uh, because you know, if you ever read um, Cedric Robinson's um, Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, in the first chapters, all, it's part of it's about Shakespeare and the creation of Othello as a, a character. And he shows that the, the, the depth of anti-black racism that we come to know in the 18th and 19th century was not the case when he wrote Shakespeare, and, and he explains why that's the case. Uh, but ultimately, I think one of the things that's so interesting is how um, with the, the very presence of unfree labor makes the question of freedom more urgent. For John Locke, John Locke is writing about the new world at the very moment when the levelers and diggers are battling over the question of the, the, the um, enclosure acts and fighting over the commons. And so he's reflecting, he's, making, he's having a debate with them about you know, why you got to enclose the commons and how undeveloped land has to be developed as he's writing, as he's thinking about like, having written the, the foundations of the South Carolina Constitution and thinking about like, how do we deal with the Indians and the Africans in, in, in Carolina. So those simultaneous processes of trying to transform unfree labor into, into capital, into wealth, into commodities, as you are reflecting on the, the problems of freedom, I think creates the opening for this kinds of reflection. So the only way that you could, just, and I'm, I'm just riffing here, but the, but the idea of being in the state of nature, the state of nature is in its face not necessarily in the English countryside, but in his face in the, in the New World. But, but again, he cannot separate himself from what's happening uh, in the English countryside. So the state of nature becomes a way, um, a kind of ahistorical way, right, to mark people as outside of that space. To me, it's John Stuart Mill who's more interesting because his thing is that you know, colonization or colonialism is the very, the very thing that could transform people out of the state of nature into civilization, but they're not quite there yet. So the best way for them to introduce, for them to receive democracy is through despotism. And that's the, the mill that you all read in your like Western civ classes, but they skip that part sometimes. You know, does that answer your question? That's a long answer, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, it's not my, this is my, not my field, by the way. I wasn't training any of this stuff, so. So thank you, first off, for giving a phenomenal talk. Um, very inspirational. 
Um, there were two moments in your presentation, um, one in which you talked about the importance of saying black people uh, versus black bodies and sort of challenging the register that we are just bodies. Um, and the second was when you said you were not going to show the picture of Emmett Till's body. And I was wondering if you can speak to how you have cultivated a, a pedagogy that challenges some of those norms that um, replicate brown and black people as bodies or as spectacles um, or um, how, how we might engage talking about this history in a visual representational way mm -hmm. and sort of be careful of those boundaries of doing things like showing lynchings in class and those right, types right. of things. Right, that's an excellent question. You have such brilliant students here. I tell you, if, if, I tell you, if, if my wife liked Kansas, but I come here. Um, <laughs> But let, let, me, let me take the last part of your question first, because um, I actually, in terms of the decision not to show uh, the tortured, dead bodies of black people, I learned that from you, from you. What I mean by that is that the student movements and the struggles that have emerged since Trayvon Martin have actually resisted that. And in a way, because I've been teaching for 30 years, and I always showed the picture of Emmett Till, the shock value. And it wasn't until young people like yourself pushed back. And, and the reason why young people pushed back is because in the world of social media, which I, you know, I didn't grow up in social media, right? One of the tragedies and why I think the question of trauma has become so dominant, and I've written a little bit about this, um, is because you all are, are um, subjected to a constant loop, a never-ending barrage of images of not just dead bodies, but bodies in the process of losing their lives, right? That is, uh, that's unacceptable. And it's not until that barrage really hit your generation that it began to hit me. So I, I made that decision thanks to you, right? And thanks to all the students who really pushed, pushed us on that. Um, on, the on the first question, that's why I'm supposed to stand by here. Um, on the first question about, um, uh, what's the other, other part of it? I'm getting old too. So. <laughs> How to create a pedagogy that effectively talks about these things and relabeling is one of the things you mentioned, black people versus black Oh, right, bodies. right, like, exactly. No, no, that's, that's actually really important. Um, you know, and that's the other thing that has happened was th there is a tendency to focus on um, black bodies, and I understand it. I understand it because um, part of what the, the emphasis or the language of black bodies does, and it, a lot of it comes out of the Afro-pessimism scholarship and stuff, which I have my own critique of, but the, the, what it does do, which is in some ways generative, is to recognize that, uh, that anti-black racism, racism has a um, uh, both spectacular and spectral element. That is that you, know, you see, you recognize, you associate certain things. And I could see that. My, my pushback on that had to do with the way in which uh, we were calling ourselves black bodies. And, and I like, and I was sort of saying, well, no, we're people, because with people comes sociality, and sociality that is creating communities so necessary because in the end, um, though we may be black and brown bodies marked a certain kind of way, as people we have the capacity to connect with each other and with other people who, who may not be like us. And so in some respects, the ultimate goal of reconstruction and social democracy, the ultimate goal of abolition whether the abolitions in the 1860s and 1960s or 21st century, has always been to end all forms of oppression on every single scale. And number one, and to recognize that the forms of oppression that may be specific to us, they may feel specific to us, like colonial domination and racism, actually affect every single person. That no one is untouched. And this is a lesson you learn from M.A. Césaire. It's a lesson from all kinds of thinkers who've sort of figured out that the violence even when people participate in that violence, they're doing violence to themselves. And we've got, we've got to stop it. And the world that we're trying to create, I think, 
is a world not just trying to solve the problems of anti-black racism, but that is just the foundational question of a larger question of how to end all forms of oppression everywhere, always. It's not something that could be solved like the end of history, but it's a constant struggle that will continue to go on because for every time we resolve something, sometimes we produce new forms of oppression. We resolve one thing and we produce new forms. You know? And I could give you lots of examples from you know, contradictions within the history of feminism, contradictions in the history of civil rights. Anti, you know, there's all kinds of ways in which we produce new forms, but each of those forms reveal themselves as contradictions and we have to attend to them which then produce more, more contradictions. So it's not like we can solve everything, but what we have to do is always recognize that, um, that what we're fighting for ultimately is, touches every single human being you know, on the planet in one way or another. Does that kind of answer your question? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Yes. Yeah, um, you could. I was supposed to be mic'd. Is, yeah, it's now yeah, working. No, Thank you. Um, your argument, especially in the early phase, um, was really describing this, this multi-continental process of exploitation, expropriation, proletarianization, which I think we've typically seen as some kind of economic logic of commercial and then industrial capitalism. Why, what is it in the language and rhetoric of war that helps us understand that process better? And moving forward, what is it in the language and rhetoric of war that helps us move towards the kind of democratic polity that I think you thought Reconstruction could have invented right. but did not? Right. How does that language or rhetoric actually help us in any way? Right. Well, you know, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe it is actually very limiting. Um, I guess there are two things I would say to that in terms of the first, um, that you know, by understanding, and it's not so, so much as a rhetoric as much as an analytic in which uh, war is the process by which certain um, re um, uh, disruptions take place. So for example, um, dispossession and slavery. To think of dispossession and slavery as not just an agreement or a contract, but a that requires um, uh, a complete rupture of what was considered just customary. Like, this is my land, this has been my land forever, wait, who are you? And then to, to change that customary practice requires a certain kind of violence. And that violence is, is war. And, and what's interesting about war is that wars, uh, as rhetorics, wars are, are never conducted by uh, those who are most interested in the dispossession. So what I mean by that is that if the Virginia Joint Stock Company comes in and there's a certain group of governors who actually want to make land available for certain big landowners, they need other people to come in and fight those wars to fight the Indian wars. Um, if there are battles against enclosure and there are movements against enclosure, that it's not the, it's not the crown and not um, uh, the new emerging uh, uh, classes that do the fighting. So war also requires a certain kind of ability to mobilize people against a common enemy. So the common enemy ends up, to produce a common enemy means to produce a fiction about who, who the enemy is and what the enemy means and represents. And I think that part of what I don't deal with in the talk, but I think is very, very important, is how is it that all these like, poor white people could be dedicated to a confederacy that wasn't dedicated to them? How could they mobilize on the basis of the paltry wages of white skin privilege to wage war against people who actually should be their allies? We could see this also in terms of um, those who participate in internal capture of enslaved, of African people, and how some of those people don't benefit from a trade, but for some reason they see another person as an enemy. They're told that this person represents a threat or danger. Or the war on terror, in which many, many people commit to or committed to a war on terror without even recognizing um, 
you know, what is the basis of the production of that figure as an enemy? Cold, I mean, so, so we see this all the time where um, the only way that you could succeed in dispossession is by mobilizing people for whom they don't, be, who don't benefit. That's one way I think that war actually matters. Um, another way in which the rhetoric of war um, works, and that is, in some respects, understanding a war for, for democracy. You know, and I'm not committed, I'm not wedded to that. Um, part of what, the, the light that went on in my brain um, about three year, two years ago was recognizing that what we think of as wars of resistance, whether it's Nat Turner's Rebellion or whether it's, you know, um, uh, the, you know, uprisings, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in, in cities or whatever it is, that a lot of these are, are actually wars of self-defense. In the case of slavery especially, wars of self-defense, and that is that they're, they're fighting, engaged in acts of self-defense to defend themselves and to try to repossess themselves. Because the amazing thing, and I just want to, I'll stop with this part, the amazing thing, and I learned this from my teacher, Cedric Robinson, about uh, almost all post-emancipation moments is that the wars do not result in retaliation. This is amazing to me, that, that newly freed people were not interested in like stringing up the former masters. Uh, they were interested in land, but the kind of retaliation you'd expect after brutality, and this is the Caribbean as well. The Caribbean, Latin America, North America, you don't have those kind of massive retaliations. When, the, when slavery ends, presumably the war ends. And the only ones who continue to wage war are those who lost their property in human beings. They're the only ones. It's not the other way around. So when I talk about the black militias, um, people can sometimes confuse that. They say, well, you know, you're supporting armed self-defense. Well, you know, in these cases, it, it wasn't the black militias that were the initiator, initiators of violence. If they had a choice, they would do what they said in the Bible, lay down their, their sword and shield, and then go and cultivate. You know, same thing with, you could, well, you could talk about other places like that, where people don't really want the violence, but the violence is there, it's already embedded, it's part of the fabric of everyday life because it's a product, it's a process of trying to repossess lost land and lost labor. It's a, an attempt to try to re-enslave. And so armed self-defense becomes the only thing they have left to keep that from happening. Um, so that's one way to, to rethink you know, how this is ultimately war.